And this is it, folks, my final review in the King of the Ring review series right here in WrestleRant. For the better part of the last month, I've been talking about every installment in the King of the Ring pay-per-views history from 1993 from today, 2002. And we're talking about every single pay-per-view tonight. We're capping it off with our 2002 review as seen on the WWE Network. So again, overall, a lot like the 01 show. Not an amazing event overall, especially compared to other really, really good shows from 2002, including SummerSlam and Survivor Series and the Rumble and No Way Out and pay-per-views of that you know caliber. This show, just in comparison to old King of the Ring events, was a lot better than the previous ones. Again, maybe I'm just biased because I love the year of 02 in wrestling and specifically WWE. But I really did think this was a solid show, especially historically speaking for what came out of it. Um, who emerged victorious as the King of the Ring and the champion, whatever else, kind of setting the stage for a really, really good summer season in WWE. So opening the show, our first King of the Ring semifinal match between RVD and Chris Jericho, Raw versus SmackDown, and that was the whole uh, purpose of this tournament. If you see the brackets, the one side of the brackets was from Raw, the other side of the brackets were from SmackDown. Raw and SmackDown met in the semifinals of this pay-per-view, uh, of the tournament on this pay-per-view. So I thought that was really cool. I mean, this was right after the brand split went into effect. So the Raw versus SmackDown matches were a thing of rarity even at that point in time. So it felt cool to have a guy from Raw and SmackDown rep be represented in the semifinals of the tournament. Ultimately, it was two Raw guys going to the finals, but that would also be explained in storyline and that it was two Canadians that got that got screwed over in Testin Jericho and Lance Cade and Lance Cade, Lance Storm and Christian got really pissed about that, kind of planting the seeds for the uh, un-American stable that they would have that summer, so... Didn't have a really uh, a huge problem with that, but I did like the fact that the semifinals were set up by Raw versus SmackDown matches. But this match anyway, RVD and Chris Jericho, really, really good match. I thought their match, obviously, from Raw in 2013 was really uh, was, was better, but still, RVD and Jericho, you can't go wrong. They have really good chemistry with each other. The perfect two guys to put in the opening slot to have a great match. So good stuff. RVD goes over. He was just so freaking over in 2002. He was the Intercontinental Champion going into the show, and he left the show as IC Champion too. His title was not defended in any of these matches, but RVD did beat Jericho here to advance to the finals of the 2002 King of the Ring Tournament. After that, another semifinal matchup, Brock Lesnar taking on SmackDown's Test. Um, and a decent match given who was involved and how limited Test was. They've never really been high on him as a worker. But I thought Lesnar brought the best out of him. I mean, I mean, Lesnar worked with. I mean, it's really hard to say who's, who, you know, what be Lesnar's best type of matches were with, who they were with rather. I mean, he's worked. He's had amazing matches with collegiate athletes like Kurt Angle, with big men like Big Show, and with small guys even like CM Punk. Um, you know, Roman Reigns even they had a really good match. So it's really hard to say who Brock Lesnar works best with. He works with a multitude of different styles, but. Uh, working with a fellow big man and test on the show did not really hinder his ability to have a really good match anyway. I mean, I thought it was not a really good match, but really rather a, a decent match, and Tess looked good here. He didn't botch anything. He didn't look awful. Lesnar looked good. I mean, we had the typical finish with Lesnar that Tess came close to winning. Uh, Paul Heyman interfered. He grabbed Tess's leg, and then Brock Lesnar took advantage, scored the victory to advance to the finals of the tournament. So uh, that was kind of the, the theme throughout Brock Lesnar's, the majority of Brock Lesnar's matches in 2002 that he would have to resort to Paul Heyman getting involved in order to win his matches, which I didn't really think was necessary given Brock was a beast anyway. And then he would go on to win the championship clean at SummerSlam, so I'm not exactly sure what the point of that was. But anyway, so a decent match with Brock Lesnar advancing to the finals. After that, for the Cruiserweight Championship, Jamie Noble beating the Hurricane to win the title. Um, they had been feuding for a few weeks before this. Nydia had been teasing going with the Hurricane. Maybe she was dating the Hurricane when he was still Gregory Helms or Shane Helms or whatever. Whatever the case was, she turned on him, joined up with Jamie Noble, helps him win the Cruiserweight Championship, and that would kick off their long reign together on top on SmackDown as the uh, as the Cruiserweight Division's power couple, so to speak. So... A fun match uh, with the right result. Jamie Noble was the right guy to put the championship on. He was really coming into his own as a singles guy. The Hurricane, it's really hard to believe that he was around for as long as he was. I think he kind of came in to what he was in 2001, I think, when he debuted in WWE after the invasion angle. Uh, you know, obviously ended in whatever in, in the year of 2001. But he was around until like 2005 before he split off with Rosie. So the Hurricane character was around for a lot longer than I think a lot of people realize. But anyway, as far as this match goes... Decent match with the right results. After that, we had Ric Flair versus Eddie Guerrero, which is like a wrestling fan's dream on paper. And it was a really good match. The only thing against it was that it didn't really need the interference from Bubba Ray and Benoit and whoever else. The story of the match was a lot, was very convoluted, I want to say, just because Ric Flair was heel for like all of a month or two. 
And then he, they turned him back babyface because um, they turned him back babyface as a result of Stone Cold Steve Austin's firing from the company. Or he quit, rather, and they or they fired him, you know, depending on who you talk to. So they had to turn Ric Flair face fast after being a heel for all of a month and feeding with Stone Cold. So they turned him back babyface and put him in a feud with Benoit and Eddie. Um, Eddie had just come back to the company. He looked really good here. I mean, he looked like he was juiced the gills, unfortunately, but... Um, when he first came back. But Benoit, anyway, he looked good here in the role that he had. He wasn't really wrestling still at this point in time. I don't, think, I don't really remember exactly when he would come back to action. I know he was back in action by the end of the year on SmackDown. I think he was even... No, he even wrestled at SummerSlam. So it wasn't... It must not have been too much longer before he was back in action. Maybe he was already wrestling by this point in time. But he wasn't in action on the show. Um, so anyway, so he came out trying to help you know, Eddie win. But in the end, it backfired after Bubba Ray came in to make a statement, as he said earlier on in the evening helping Ric Flair score the victory. So uh, a good match without all the interference and all that aside. I don't even really know what that set up because Bubba Ray, I think it set up some sort of tag team match for Vengeance or something like that for the following month or for later on in the month. I, mean, I, didn't, I can't remember exactly, but it's kind of a waste of uh, Ric Flair, or rather of Eddie and Benoit. Nevertheless, though, um, good match. Ric Flair goes over in the end. It just The whole story behind us, as good of a match as it was, the finish kind of took away from the overall, not enjoyment of the matchup, but rather just the overall quality, maybe knocking it down half a star or so, and just a lack of story. I mean, the story was there, but it just felt rushed just because Austin left so abruptly and they had to get Ric Flair on the card somehow because he wasn't feeling the Stone Cold anymore. So they put together this match, and it made for a really, really good match, a match that I don't know if we ever saw after that, Ric Flair versus Eddie Guerrero. So after that, for the Women's Championship, Molly Holly defeating Trish Stratus to win the gold. Um, the match itself wasn't bad. It was fine for what it was. The story of the match was what was so stupid about it. Molly Holly was technically the heel here, but the whole point, the whole, I guess, focus of the feud was in Molly Holly not being as hot as Trish Stratus and that she had an ugly ass or she was fat or whatever. So it was a very ass-backwards, I guess, no pun intended, uh, focus of the feud here just because you would think that with Trish and... The commentator, the commentators bullying Molly Holly, that that would automatically make her the babyface, but apparently not because she didn't have a nice ass. They turned her heel, or I'm not exactly sure where they were going with this, and it was dropped a short time afterwards. So maybe they didn't even know where they were going with this angle. But the match itself wasn't bad. I just thought the whole dichotomy of the matchup and the story character, you know, the story development and whatever else, the character development was kind of off and on. I mean, kind of off and odd. Um, but still, that was very odd. Molly Holly in the end, though, bottom line, like I said, still, or rather the new WWE Women's Champion. After that, Kurt Angle taking on Hulk Hogan. So a match that really kind of came out of nowhere. Hulk Hogan dropped the, uh, the championship to Undertaker at Judgment Day. And then he lost to, uh, Triple H on an episode of SmackDown to, uh, lose his opportunity to go back for the championship at King of the Ring. And then we had Kurt Angle say that a Hulk Hogan isn't an American icon. So they just kind of randomly put these guys together out of nowhere. But I'm not complaining because it made sense in storyline to have the two American heroes against one another. And it made for a good match. One of Hogan's best matches in 2002, if not his best match in 2002, with the exception, obviously, of his WrestleMania match with The Rock. From a wrestling standpoint, though, Angle carried Hogan to his probably greatest wrestling match that he had had in his comeback. Probably the last really good wrestling match that Hogan would ever have in WWE. Um, so they produced a really good match. The very surprising finish. Hulk Hogan tapping out. JR had questioned on commentary. Has Hulk Hogan ever tapped out before? Have we ever seen the Hulkster submit? And honestly, I don't think we did. He never tapped out. Definitely not for sure in his original WWE run from the late 70s to the early 90s or the late early 80s, whatever. For however long he was around, I don't think he ever tapped out. And in the months that preceded this pay-per-view, I don't think he had tapped out either. Obviously, I don't know. I don't think he would have submitted on Raw or something, so... It was a history-making moment. It really set a lot for Angle to be able to beat Hulk Hogan clean, especially by submission. So it was a big win by Angle. Unfortunately, it really wouldn't go anywhere. Um, he had faced like Rey Mysterio in the opener at SummerSlam. It wouldn't be. It wouldn't be until later on in 2002 that Angle was back to, you know, achieving greatness on SmackDown and the WWE title picture. He didn't win the championship until like Armageddon of that year. So it's not like this big win catapulted him as a single star on SmackDown or anything along those lines. But still, a good match. And like I said, probably Hogan's. Last truly great match in WWE. Our second to last match in the finals of the 2002 King of the Ring Tournament. Uh, Brock Lesnar taking on RVD in a, in a good match, but Brock Lesnar was mostly an offense for a majority of the contest. Pretty much dominating, Bro or rather, RVD. Um, the twist in the tournament this year, or the last, I guess, the last time it was held on pay-per-view, was that not only would the winner become the 2002 King of the Ring, but rather the winner would also become the number one contender to the 
Undisputed Championship. We're not the number one contender automatically, but we're to receive a shot at the Undisputed Championship at SummerSlam. So that was pretty cool. At that point, despite how over RVD was, you kind of knew they weren't going to have Brock Lesnar got beat, get beat here. So it was mostly a squash match, an extended squash match. You got in some offense, but by and large, it was all Lesnar. Lesnar, in the end, going over with an F5 to become the 2002 King of the Ring and secure his spot in the main event of SummerSlam for the Undisputed Championship. So, good match. Not really a competitive contest. More of a squash than I, more of a one-sided squash than I thought it would be. I um, was hoping for something more than that, but still good while it lasted. Then the main event for the WWE Championship, The Undertaker defending against Triple H in just an awful match. I mean, the undercard of this show is really good for the most part. The tournament matches weren't that bad. They were actually pretty good. The main event of this show was what really dragged this show down and probably the reason why it wasn't brought back, to be honest with you. This main event sucked. And it's not like Ang or rather uh, Undertaker and Triple H had bad chemistry. Obviously, they had a great match at WrestleMania 17. Two amazing back-to-back -back matches at WrestleMania 28 and 27. So I'm not exactly sure what went wrong here. I mean, maybe it's because Undertaker was so over as a, as a heel. People liked him. They wanted to cheer him. Triple H just wasn't clicking as the babyface he should have been. It was very weird because obviously the, the WWE title changed hands a number of times in 2002. It went from Jericho to Triple H at WrestleMania, Triple H to the or Triple H to Hulk Hogan at Backlash, Hogan to Taker at Judgment Day, Triple H would lose here, and then Taker would lose in that triple threat match to Rock and Angle, or rather just the Rock in that triple threat match with Angle at Vengeance the following month, and then drop it back to Brock Lesnar at SummerSlam. So again, so a really weird, I mean, not a, not, it wasn't the worst, you know, uh, it was like a game of hot potato with a championship, I'm not complaining about that, but just where Triple H was at this point in time, there were obviously guys that were ready to surpass him in the packing order in terms of, as baby faces. Brock Lesnar was really getting over and he was getting hot that summer, Hulk Hogan was back, so it was, and RVD was a lot more over than Triple H was, I don't know, just odd, just odd match, and it just, it didn't really work, their styles didn't gel, just an awful match, the only thing worth watching about the match, the only thing that really made it entertaining for me, was Rock's interference, he came back after Stone Cold left, and set his sights in the Undisputed Championship, having a hilarious backstage segment with Goldust and Booker T, by the way, on this show, just great shit, so he comes out, does commentary, he tries to interfere, he hits, I think, Triple H with the chair by accident, he gets involved, and ultimately calls Triple H the match, Undertaker in the end, retaining the title, um, so Rock lays out Undertaker, Triple H lays out Rock, and then Undertaker lays out Triple H, so Undertaker is still the last man standing at the end of the show, still the WWE Champion, before losing the belt at the Vengeance pay-per-view the following month, so... Awful main event, like I said, not really good at all, kind of ended the show on a sour note, Rock's involvement saved it from being a complete disaster, um, but despite that though, I thought overall it was a good show, I thought it was a really good show, again, maybe just because I really enjoy the year of 02 in WWE, so that's why I enjoy the show more than most, and maybe more than a lot of the predecessors, you know, the previous installments of King of the Ring, but still, I wouldn't say, I thought the semifinal matches and the finals weren't really that bad, were a lot better than some other finals matches we've had in the King of the Ring tournament in years past, so, for what it was, I'd give the show a thumbs up. Not two thumbs up, but still a pretty solid show. Um, SummerSlam was a lot better. A lot of the other O2 pay-per-views were a lot better than this. But still a good show. The King of the Ring tournament, the right guy went over, and some good matches. A really good opener between RVD and Jericho. Jamie Noble and Hurricane served a purpose. A fun little match. The women's match was nothing of note, but we also had a new women's champion crowned as well. Angle and Hogan was a pleasant surprise, with Kurt Angle going over via submission. Like I said, Lesnar was the right guy to go over in the King of the Ring tournament. And unfortunately, just ended with an awful main event. But everything else was good, though, for the most part. King of the Ring 2002. And those are my thoughts on it, as seen in the WWE Network. And that does it for my reviews of the King of the Ring pay-per-views, as seen in the network. It's been a fun past month, talking about every King of the Ring pay-per-view and watching every the King of the Ring pay-per-view. And despite how bad and how atrocious some of them were, it was fun watching them back on the network. And I appreciate you guys checking out my reviews of the shows over the past month right here on WrestleRant. So what's next? What is next for WrestleRant going forward? So for the remainder of the summer, coming up next, my next WrestleRant video will be reviewing the 2015 SummerSlam pay-per-view before SummerSlams, before this year's SummerSlam installment. So be sure to check that out, my next WrestleRant video. After that, we just have a bunch of miscellaneous reviews. I'll be talking about the 1985 Wrestling Classic Show, which you might not even know existed. I certainly didn't, but when I was going through the network library, I saw it. So I'll be watching that and reviewing that in the weeks to come, the, 90, the 1986 show. Um, I forgot what it was, like the uh, something, not Tuesday in Texas, but one of those type of shows. 
Uh, so that's going to be coming up. If you're interested in that, checking out some old pay-per-view reviews. Those are coming up the weeks to come beyond that. I really have no idea. I completely forgot. i got to check out the schedule again. But bottom line, though, my next video will be reviewing the 2015 SummerSlam show, which, honestly, it's it's funny, though. I'm, I'm looking forward to watching that and reviewing it just because, I, for, for one thing, I was at that show. I was there. So that's going to offer an entirely new perspective and thoughts on the show, considering I was there and have a different perspective on it. And two, I have yet to watch it in its entirety since I was there. Obviously, I mean, it was a four-hour show, so I didn't really want to sit back and watch the whole full four hours. Very rarely do I go back and watch only one match from a pay-per-view, unless it's like on the anniversary or something. But since we're quickly coming up on the one-year anniversary of SummerSlam 2015, I'll be reviewing that show and talking about my experience and stuff. Not really the experience, but kind of my thoughts on each match and being there live for it. So, And it'll be fun to watch it back for the first time since I was there and kind of get an all-new not only my perspective from being there, but also a different perspective from watching it on the network, which I've yet to do. Um, I've watched back, you know, like Rollins and Cena in the main event back on the network and various occasions with RJ and whoever else, but I have not yet seen the entire pay-per-view, um, in its entirety anyway, like I said, on the network. So we'll see. Not yet, you know, it's seen it in its entirety on the network, that is. So I look forward to watching it and reviewing it in my next WrestleRant video, so be sure to stay tuned for that. I thought there was something else I was going to plug or say before we close it off here, but I think that's it. Oh, this is what it was. So if you're wondering, like I've done in years past or like I've done in, you know, I did with the Rumble early, earlier this year, where my reviews of every other SummerSlam are. So in past years, in 2014, I reviewed a handful of SummerSlam shows. Last year, I really went all out from June to August and reviewing every SummerSlam pay-per-view ever from 1988 to uh, 2014. Obviously, my 2015 review is coming up next week or in my next video. But it, um, if you want to check out any of my past reviews of SummerSlam, be sure to just go back in the archives here on WrestleRant, go to the playlist, WrestleRant, scroll all the way down to last year's, last summer, and the summer before that, my reviews of every SummerSlam from 1998's, from 98's, 1988's installment, rather, to 2014, and 2015 is quickly coming up right here on WrestleRant. So until then, guys, be sure to find me on the Twitter. Follow me there at WrestleRant on Facebook at Facebook.com, backslash Graham.Jason.Matthews, and right here on YouTube by liking, commenting, sharing, and subscribing. So until next time, guys, be sure to have a great week, weekend, whatever it might be. I'm Graham Jason Matthews, and I'll catch you folks down the road.